Good afternoon. Thank you. Welcome, uh, each and everyone, to our conference. Um, the call is to come and get equipped, and that is what uh, we're here to do this weekend, to learn more from Calvin Smith and Answers in Genesis, uh, to answer questions I'm sure that we, we all have. And uh, we've probably even known some of these things, but it's great to be refreshed and to hear again uh, about these answers uh, from God's word. And so to begin our, our time today, we're going to sing a song, 159, it's beyond the screen behind me, and it says, praise to the Lord, praise to the Lord, the Almighty, the King of creation. And I'm going to ask you to stand with me, and we'll sing all four verses of this after the introduction. Praise to Thank you. You may have a seat. Again, a very warm welcome to each and everyone gathered with us this afternoon. It's certainly a really great crowd, and, and we trust that as we sit under the teaching this afternoon and tomorrow, that uh, we will be blessed as we hear from the Lord. And uh, I won't say much about uh, announcements. I'll come up after our speaker and uh, just mention about the snack that will be taking place afterwards. Um, but uh, again, just glad to have each of you here. I uh, want to mention just a couple of things um, that was mentioned last evening. So back in uh, the fireside room, you'll see a display of some books. And I'm sure our speaker will talk to you about some of that. But there's also back there a blue box that is a Q&A box. And so if you have questions that you maybe would like to be addressed at the 7.30 Q&A session, uh, you're invited to put those in there in between sessions. And so today we'll be talking about biblical biology, if you've uh, seen the handout of the plan for the remainder of the, the meetings, and we look forward to that. But I'm just going to give thanks now and, and just uh, commit our day to the Lord in prayer, and then we'll call out on our speaker. Our God and Father, uh, we do indeed adore you and praise you and honor you for who you are and all that you have done. We thank you, Father, uh, that we can gather in this place and, and learn more of yourself and just be reminded of the truths of Scripture, of the origins and 
uh, where we come from and why we're here. We thank you that we can find answers to all these questions in the Word of God. We thank you that it is trustworthy and inerrant and that we can uh, learn of uh, all these good things in it. So, Father, we just pray for your hand of blessing upon our time together this afternoon and today. And we ask you just the strengthening hand upon Kelvin, our speaker, that you would just bless him. And uh, again, Father, that all things done here would be uh, bring honor and glory to your name. We ask these things in the name of our Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Good afternoon. You guys came back. Wow, I didn't scare you away last night. That's good. Awesome. It's great to be here, and it's a little warmer out than it was yesterday, which is nice. So uh, we're going to continue on here, and we're going to do a talk called Biblical Biology. And sometimes when you're um, discussing these things that the Answers in Genesis ministry uh, goes over with people, uh, even many times Christians will be like, well, biology, what, what do you mean biology? You know, when you come to church, you're supposed to talk about the Lord. You're supposed to talk about salvation. You're supposed to talk about spiritual things. Um, but of course, the Lord is our creator, and he's created everything, right? Everything in heaven and earth. And uh, it's interesting that when Jesus was speaking to Nicodemus, right, he actually differentiated something. He said, uh, if I've told you earthly things and you don't believe, how can you believe if I tell you heavenly things? See, the Bible doesn't just talk about heavenly things. It talks about earthly things as well. And uh, let's look at Genesis 1.11. God said, let the earth sprout vegetation, plants yielding seed, and fruit trees bearing fruit in it, uh, in which is their seed, each according to its kind on the earth, and it was so. The earth brought forth vegetation, plants yielding seed according to their own kinds, and trees bearing fruit in which is their seed, each according to its kind. This is talking about biology. He goes on to talk about animals and how they reproduce according to their kind. That's the topic of biology, right? And the thing is, the world is teaching something very different about biology today. Uh, it doesn't teach what the Word of God says, that God created plants and animals and, you know, people in the beginning, fully formed, each reproducing after their own kind. What it teaches is that one kind of creature morphs into a different kind of creature over millions and millions of years, and that is, of course, the story of evolution. Now, the fact is, I, I'm not a scientist, but I've worked with many scientists for 25 years now, um, some very brilliant people, and we do th see things changing, right? But is that evolution? That's really what we're going to look into here. Uh, the outline of the talk is this. I'm going to show you the current paradigm that's being taught in biology, the belief in the story of evolution, and the problems involved there. I'm going to show you some scientific evidence for design in biology that confirms the, the Bible, and then we're going to discuss the ethical ramifications of this debate. What happens to a society where you just teach everybody that you can explain everything without God? Because we are living in a quite a godless society today. So, First, let's begin with why this is important. You know, um, this quote I'm going to show you here is from a, a fellow named T.C. Pickney. He's kind of like the, the pastor of pastors amongst the Southern Baptists. And uh, in a, uh, a conference that he was doing several years ago now, he, he was teaching this, this group of pastors, hundreds of pastors before him, and he said, we're losing our children. Research indicates 70% of teens who are involved in a church youth group will stop attending church within two years of their high school graduation. Think about that statement. Now, why is that? Well, this is from a Christian leader pleading with other Christian leaders, but if you don't know what the problem is, you can't fix it. And so I want to give you another quote here from the other end of the spectrum. This is from an atheist, Frank Zindler, and this is what he had to say. This, this is taken from a debate where this man, Frank, is debating uh, uh, William Lane Craig, a Christian uh, who believes in the story of evolution, by the way. And uh, this is what the atheist said. The most devastating thing that biology did to Christianity was the discovery of biological evolution. Now that we know that Adam and Eve were never were real people, the central myth of Christianity is destroyed. If there never was an Adam and Eve, there never was an original sin. If there never was an original sin, then there's no need of salvation. And if there's no need of salvation, there's no need of a savior. And I submit that puts Jesus, historical or otherwise, into the ranks 
of the unemployed. Now, if you're a Christian, that's a pretty blasphemous statement, correct? But this man is an atheist, and from his point of view, that's completely logical. And I want to point something out. He's debating a Christian who believes God used billions of years of evolution to create, rather than what the Word of God plainly says in Genesis. Um, So the Christian really doesn't have a good answer if the Christian believes that God used ape-like creatures and then became people and where we're Adam and Eve and all that. By the way, um, many Christians have kind of adopted this now. They're, they're kind of like, well, we don't want to fight against evolution anymore, so we'll just say God did it that way. But you don't earn a lot of respect from atheists when you <laughs> compromise on the Word of God. Here's a, a quote from Richard Dawkins. I quoted him yesterday. He's probably the most, still the most popular atheist on the planet, writes all sorts of anti-Christian books and declares evolution is the reason why he doesn't believe in God. And uh, Richard said this, Oh, but of course, the story of Adam and Eve was only symbolic, wasn't it? Symbolic? Jesus had himself tortured and executed for a symbolic sin by a non-existent individual? Nobody not brought up in the faith could reach any other verdict other than barking mad. (laughs) He's saying, these Christians that say God used evolution to create, they're nuts. How could you believe that? It doesn't make sense. There has to be a real Adam, a real Eve, etc., So let's get into this. Let's get into the current paradigm in biology and some of the problems involved. And first, what I want to do is define the term evolution, because I find this term is used so many different ways. For example, if you look at the average textbook, you may see this kind of reference, changes in gene frequencies and expression in populations over time. Well, if that's the definition of evolution, I would be an evolutionist, and I'm not one, okay? And I don't want to misrepresent what an evolutionist would believe, so I'm going to quote the the famous evolutionist Kirkut, okay? And he described the general theory of evolution this way. It's the theory that all the living forms in the world have arisen from a single source, which itself came from an inorganic form. So here's what he's outlining, if you don't catch this, okay? He believes that at one time there was no life. And then there was a first living thing. And then that first living thing diversified and became every living thing that's ever been on the planet. And that's typified by Darwin's famous uh, tree of life diagram that he had in his book, Origin of Species. So if this definition of evolution is true, then evolution would have to be a natural process where matter and or energy constantly creates new genetic information. Now, this is kind of the main plank of my talk here, this particular talk, so I need you to focus in on this, Okay. If evolution is true, it would have to be a creative process. It would have to have mechanisms that are constantly creating new forms, functions, and features that never existed before. Because we understand uh, DNA, of course, is the genetic library for any living thing on the planet, okay? And it really is a coded language system. You know how we have letters in our alphabet? Well, DNA has four chemical letters, and they're spelled out in three-letter words called codons. And those words spell out all the genetic information for trees or plants or dogs or cats or whatever genome you're talking about. And it contains all the instructions for the construction, operation, and maintenance of whatever creature you're talking about, okay? So it's the genetic library, we would say. We know what libraries are, libraries of information. So let's just go with this story that we're being told, that at once there was this first living thing. Well, that first living thing would have had to have a very small library of information. Why? Because it was the first living thing, okay? It's just barely alive. So it has to have the minimum amount of genetic information to be a functional living thing, which means, you know, it's got some kind of information for some kind of outer layer to protect it from the environment. And uh, it's got some way of extracting energy from the environment. It's got some kind of power plant and, you know, library of information for that. And it's got some kind of blueprint so it can pass on those instructions to the next generation and some kind of decoding device to read the blueprint because blueprints are useless without a decoder. However, that's an incredible amount of information, but let's just go with the story, Okay. Let's just say we get a first living thing just assembles itself through chance processes. And then it evolves over millions of years into, say, something like a horse. Now, what do you have to do to the genetic library of some amoeba or something to turn it into a horse? You would have to write out and add billions 
of bits of genetic information for forms, functions, and features that never existed before. Because amoebas don't have lungs, and they don't have blood, and they don't have blood clotting systems, and they don't have eyes, and they don't have bones, and they don't have all of those things that a horse does. So the question for the evolutionist becomes, where does the genetic information come from? You see, people are taught all sorts of stories all the time in schools and universities now. Things like, hey, did you know that dinosaurs evolved into birds over millions of years? Anybody ever observe that? Oh, okay, so it's a story based on some facts, okay? But when you think that through, hmm, it's not as simple as they make it out to be. You see, you need to start thinking of things like this. What exactly does a bird have that a lizard doesn't have? Well, there's many things, but I'll just pick on a few things. Uh, number one, birds have hollow bones. Lizards have solid bones. What changed the DNA instructions to make solid to hollow so that they can fly? And some of you might be thinking, well, that's not a big change. Okay, let's go with something a little bigger. How about flight navigation systems? You know, birds have them and lizards don't, right? You ever see a, a you know, flock of birds wheeling around oh, and they don't bump into each other? That's pretty sophisticated, right? And some of these birds can migrate for thousands and thousands of kilometers. That's like a GPS system that's in the brain of a bird that's not in the brain of a lizard. So what wrote out all this functional new information? G GPS systems are a little complicated, right? Okay, what else? How about the uh, locomotive ability? If lizards are doing this, right, and birds are doing that, what changed the skeletal structure? What transformed the, uh, the, the, you know, the, the, into feathers? How do you make feathers and not just one type of feather, many different types of feathers, right? What about the preening glands and all those things that manage to maintain the feathers? And um, what about the breathing apparatus? You know, birds are pretty fantastic. I've been watching some of the seabirds around here. Uh, pretty neat. And, uh, but lizards are, are kind of like us. They pant, just... Right? Birds don't do that. Birds are phenomenal. They have this lung system where as the, as the lungs are pumping, it's like a one-way jet system. It's just... <clears throat> I can't do that very long. But birds can. It's one of the reasons they can fly. And it's phenomenal because their, their air goes this way and their blood is shunted in the opposite direction. It's a cooling mechanism, again, so they can fly. It's a phenomenal design, right? So what I think students sitting under this tutelage should be doing is uh, asking intelligent questions like... Uh, Where'd all the genetic information come from? We'll get into the mechanisms proposed, but, um, and by the way, how is this creature functioning halfway between the transition? Like, you're not really a lizard anymore, and you're not a bird, you're just halfway in between. You're like a, you're like a libbird, right? <laughs> you're not quite there yet. How are you functioning as a libbird? I mean, how are you getting around as a libbird? If the lizards are doing this and the birds are doing this, what are you doing halfway in between? <laughs> How are you breathing as a libbard? How do you go halfway between and is it like a Lamaze class or something? You know, I don't know. My wife did it a couple of times. I never mastered it. Some people are like, uh, well, that's kind of facetious. No, that's science. That's what students should be asking people telling you these stories about. You see, the way information is disseminated about inf evolution, it, it, number one, it's ubiquitous. It's everywhere. Every magazine, every TV show you watch, Dora the Explorer, you know, it doesn't matter. It's always there. But the way it's introduced to people, it sometimes sounds very convincing. For example, a lot of kids go to museums and so on, and here's some photos from the... Uh, um, Natural History Museum in London, in England, and they've got their idol to Darwin set up there, and they've got all these interpretive plaques, and let's look at some of these plaques. This one says, Darwin's work supported the view that all living things have developed into the forms we see today by a process of gradual change over very long periods of time. This is what is meant by evolution. Now, you'll notice it's a small plaque, and of course, they don't have a lot of space, but what they're saying is, well, change equals evolution. No, it would have to be a very specific type of change, and this is what I'm getting at. It would have to be a type of change that could add functional genetic information for forms, functions, and features that never existed before, not just any change. Because creationists know that things are changing all the time, okay? 
But what type of change? And then at the bottom they said, well, many people find that the theory of evolution does not conflict with their religious beliefs. Well, that's actually a true statement. There are hundreds of religions on this planet, and many of them, they don't have a problem with evolution. However, if you are a Christian and you're trying to marry the story of evolution to your theology, you have massive theological implications. Because what you're now saying is God used billions of years of death, suffering, pain, and disease to create and called it very good. All before Adam sinned. And the wages of sin is death. But not if there was death before Adam sinned. You know who understands this quite well? Atheists. <laughs> show you a quote here from a French biologist, atheist, Jacques Manon. And he was being interviewed one time by a Christian who had accepted God used evolution to create. And uh, when the Christian said this to the, to the atheist, he said, well, I, I have no scientific objection to that, but I do have a moral one. And the Christian said, what? A moral objection? And he said, yeah. He goes, the struggle for uh, life and elimination of the weakest is a horrible process. I'm surprised that a Christian would defend this idea that this is the process God more or less set up in order to have evolution. Survival of the fittest where the strong destroy the weak. He actually said in, in, the, in the further quote that, you know, this is against what our, our modern um, society stands for. We protect the weak. This is what you believe God set up in order to create the destruction of the weak. Well, back to our interpretive plaques here. Uh, this one says, before Charles Darwin, most people believe that God created all living things in exactly the form that we see them today. This is the basis of the doctrine of creation. Well, actually, that's not true. See, they snuck this word exactly in there, but that's not true. No creationist I know believes that God created everything in exactly the form that we see them today. Because if God had done so, we would either look like Adam or Eve. But there's some variation even in the room here, isn't there? Yeah. So no, what God did is he created creatures, uh, sexually reproducing creatures with DNA, and you inherit half your DNA from mom and half your DNA from dad. And there's constant change occurring because of this mixture of bits of information at the same location, genetics, genes, okay? And you can have dominant and recessive, and that's why we get variations in hair color and eyes and all sorts of things because of mutations. We'll get into that. But nowhere in Scripture does it say that God created things exactly in the form that we see them today. It just says that God created kinds to reproduce according to their kinds. And of course, there would be variation there. So... Let's get into one of the main mechanisms that evolutionists will tout as to how they believe or they explain one creature you know, tra transforming into another. And uh, when Darwin was trying to explain this, when he was talking about natural selection, because you'll hear a lot about natural selection if you study evolution, um, he actually used pigeon breeding as a, an analogy to natural selection, even though it was artificial selection. And we have no problem with it. We think it's a good analogy. Um, he would take parent... Uh, populations of pigeons and he would breed them and get all sorts of weird and wacky pigeons, right? It's kind of the same thing today we do with dog breeding, right? We've got all these weird and wonderful looking dogs that we've bred over the years now, okay? So that's what I'm going to use as an example to show you how natural selection changes creatures but does not evolve them, okay? Because as I said, creationists believe in change. And to do so, I'm just going to use one trait, one genetic trait in these dogs that we're talking about here, and that's the length of their hair or their fur. So you can see mom and dad dog here, okay? They've got medium length fur. And in my um, illustration here, remember you inherit half your DNA from mom and half from dad while well, these dogs do the same thing. So they got two bits of information at the same location for the same uh, trait, the trait is the length of their hair. And in my example, the capital letter L is going to symbolize a gene for long fur. And the capital letter S is going to symbolize genes, a gene for short fur. So if the short hair gene gets expressed, it's got short, et cetera, et cetera. Some genes work in conjunction, so these dogs have medium length fur. Everybody getting this? Pretty simple stuff? Okay. So these dogs meet. It's a whirlwind romance. They get married. They decide to have kids. And uh, yeah, now what are the offspring going to inherit? They're going to inherit DNA from mom and dad, half from mom, half from dad. So it depends on what they inherit. So let's say the guy over here, he, he inherits the short hair gene from mom, short hair gene from dad. 
He's got short hair because that's the only genetics he's got. The one on the other side is the opposite. Long hair, long hair. He's got long hair. And the two in the middle are kind of like mom and dad, medium length furred dogs, okay? So let's say we get a group of dogs and there's a variety of different hair lengths, right? And um, I don't know, they start off, let's say, where I live now in Ontario and near Ingersoll. But they move up north to where I was born, which is North Bay, Ontario, the gateway to the north, okay? Let's say it's late fall, it's still quite warm, and then all of a sudden, we're going to get a natural uh, selective factor come in, and that factor would be a big winter storm. Now, what's going to happen to short-haired dogs in a freezing winter storm? Bye-bye. <laughs> right? They're not going to be able to survive. They're going to die. What's going to happen to the medium-length fur dogs? Well, they're going to get out of the area as fast as they can, leaving behind all of the dogs with long hair because they can survive in that environment. These dogs can survive in that environment. As a matter of fact, they might even move up even further north, right? Get cut off from the parent population and they might start reproducing. Now, they're only going to be able to pass on the genetic information that they have. So the next generation that they produce and the subsequent generations are all going to have long hair. Now, Again, I, I understand. I've worked with geneticists. I've worked with you know, scientists for years. So I understand it's a little more complicated than this if you study biology. There's jumping genes, dominant and recessive, all sorts of different factors. However, the point remains the same. If any of these dogs ever express the gene for short hair, they get wiped out of the environment. And eventually, you will only have dogs with long hair. Okay? This is natural selection in action. It's a real process. You can study it, okay? Creationists believe in natural selection. As a matter of fact, we thought of it first. But anyway, um, let's look at this process here and see if we can detect any evolution. Um, two questions. First question is very easy to answer because all you need to do is look at the top picture and then the bottom picture, okay? The first question is this. Have the dogs changed? Yeah, because the pictures aren't the same. <laughs> right? so they've changed, obviously. Uh, second question, have the dogs evolved? No. Because the dogs at the bottom don't have any brand new genetic information that the parent species had. As a matter of fact, they've got less genetic variability than their parents did. This is going in the exact opposite direction to what evolutionists would need to demonstrate, and yet natural selection is one of the main tools, basically, that evolutionists used to convince people of the story of evolution because they go look evolution has changed look the creatures have changed yeah but they didn't evolve they don't have bat wings or sonar or proboscis or you know anything the right they don't have anything new they've actually got less genetic information so natural selection isn't going to evolve anything speaking of dogs i have three children I've got 12 grandchildren now, so I'm in the next phase of life. But uh, years ago, if you came to my house, that, that was my oldest daughter's dog, Caleb. Uh, that would, would, he would greet you. <laughs> Not the cat, that's just a snack. Um, <laughs> no, I'm just kidding, I'm just kidding. Don't get out your cell phones, okay? <laughs> Let's cancel this dude from Ontario. He said he fed his dog cats. <laughs> no, I don't like cats, but we didn't do that. But anyway. So that was my oldest daughter's dog, and uh, my son, he wanted a dog, so he got Abby. She was kind of like a German shepherdy thing, springs in her feet, super fast. And then, of course, I had three children, so you know where this is going to go. Um, my youngest daughter, she saved up all her Christmas money and all her birthday money, and then she bought herself this thing. <laughs> and so that was what was looking up at me at the kitchen table, you know. And she called him Greg. <laughs> what kind of dog name is Greg. Like, seriously. I was living in Guelph, Ontario when we had this dog, and I had really high fences, lots of neighbors, like five different houses in the back, and I'd let him out to do his business, and then I'd want him to come in, and I'd be out there, Greg, Greg, get in here! And all my neighbors were like, man, who's he talking to, you know? <laughs> anyway, you could see the variation in the dog kind right there in my front yard. But if these creatures were able to mate, what would they create? More dogs. What does the Bible say? God created kinds of creatures to reproduce according to their own kind. And that's all we have ever observed. There's my oldest granddaughter. She's 18 now. I can't even believe it. But uh, the fact is, we see variations of the dog kind all over the world. 
And some of them have big ears and some of them have small ears. Matter of fact, when I went to Australia, I saw the dingoes and I thought, man, they look a lot like my son's dog, Abby, just the coloration was a little bit different. And uh, as mentioned, there's all sorts of traits, long and short and all sorts of stuff, right? Different, uh, different types and different kinds. You can even get fluffy here. <laughs> right? He's a pretty tough customer. But you know what they are? They're all dogs and they reproduce according to their kinds. Um, you know, we call these dogs that we create, like we, we breed them, right? We see a trait, we go, that's neat. And then we find another one. Oh, let's breed them together. And then you breed their puppies together that have those traits, right? We, we call them purebreds, but you should call them inbreds because that's what they are, right? That's why if you have an, a purebred dog, I'm really sorry for you, right? Because you spend a lot of money trying to keep that thing alive. But anyway, um, <laughs> we get all these specific traits and stuff. But if you just let them run around and, and interbreed, they all turn back into a Heinz 57, right? They go back more to like the original dog kind. But uh, man, some of these inbreds, they, they're pretty nasty. And if you've got a, you know, a weak stomach, you might not want to look at the next picture here because this is the worst inbred dog I have ever seen. So just warning you. <laughs> That's creationist humor. I'll be here all day, folks. Anyway. Now, obviously, I'm a Bible-believing Christian. I believe the Word of God uh, as, as plainly written. I'm trying to convince you of my a way of interpreting uh, things. But actually, if you go to the evolutionary literature, you can actually see that they have published on this information. For, uh, for example, this is from Science Magazine, and they're talking about the uh, genetic evidence for um, an East Asian origin of domestic dogs. And look at what, look what they say. The origin of the domestic dog from wolves has been established. We examined the mitochondrial DNA sequence variation among 654 domestic dogs, representing all major dog populations worldwide, suggesting a common origin from a single gene pool for all dog populations. You know what they just admitted? You know all the weird and wonderful dogs we get? They were all bred from wolves. That's how much genetic variability is in the wolf kind, the original dog kind. That's probably more like the original dog kind that God created that got off the ark, right? So they're not evolving. As a matter of fact, National Geographic picked up on this story and they made their own popular level version. You know, National Geographic, that great faith-building magazine. Not sarcasm if you didn't pick up on it. But anyway, they called their article from wolf to wolf. And they called it the evolution of dogs. Now, wait a sec. Um... You went from that thing to that thing? You're not evolving. You're devolving. Okay? You guys ever seen a wolf up close, even at a zoo or something? You look at it and it's like, whoa, right? It just kind of stares you down, right? Look at the thing at the bottom. Looks like it's afraid to be alive, right? What do you think has more genetic variability? I'd go with the one at the top. Okay, but I want to read you a quote from their article demonstrating what the Word of God says, because look what they admitted. Genetic studies show that dogs evolved, they always use the word, from wolves and remain as similar to the creatures from which they came as humans with different physical characteristics are to each other, which is to say not much difference at all. Well, wait a sec, if I take a person from Africa and I take a person from Asia, and I take a person from Europe and North and South America. We're all people, right? And they're all dogs, right? And the Bible says 10 times that God created kinds of creatures to reproduce according to their kind. And that's all we've ever observed. And if you want to believe that one kind magically morphed into another over millions and millions of years, I respect your faith. But stop teaching it to kids as science and fact, because no one has observed it even once. It's a story. It's a story of evolution, which is a story for people who want to believe that God does not exist. And then yet some Christians, because it's taught with such force, come to believe it as fact and science. But you can't repeat the experiment. What kind of repeatable, observable experiment could you set up in a lab showing me ape-like creatures turning into people? Actually, I had a sixth grader stick her hand up one time when I said that. And I was like, yes? And she goes, get an ape and wait. <laughs> and I was like, man, that's pretty genius for a sixth grader, you know. 
She didn't understand the sophisticated story of evolution that would say, no, 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 the, the apes didn't evolve into people. It was a common ancestor to both apes and humans. They, you know, caveat that. But anyway, I thought it was pretty good for a sixth grader. She understood something. She understood if it was going to be empirical science, you would have had to observe it. No one's observed evolution, not once. See, we like to refer to the creation orchard. God created kinds of creatures, and you can divvy up the genetic information and get all sorts of variability within the kind, but this whole evolutionary tree of life thing, nobody has ever seen. Now, once you start studying the story of evolution, you're, you're going to kind of come across some arguments you may have to stick handle through, so I want to deal with a couple of them just to get you um, aware of them. And um, one, for example, would be like, well, wait a sec, you guys say there's no new genetic information, but what about, uh, you know, pesticide use? Like when you walk into a swamp and there's all these mosquitoes and you spray your DDT and you kill the mosquitoes, but then next year you come back and there's a new breed of, of, of you know, super resistant mosquitoes and, and, the, and the DDT doesn't work. They must have evolved something. Okay, well, what's going on here? Well, long before uh, COVID, <laughs> as I've been traveling around for 25 years now, um, you know, a lot of times you're greeting people and saying hello and stuff like that. And I was, you know, I'd use hand sanitizer just to try to stay a little bit healthy. And um, you ever notice what it says on the bottle? Kills 99.9% .9 of germs. You ever notice that? That used to drive me nuts. I'd be in the shopper's drug mart. Like, is there one that kills 100%? Like, you know, because I'm going to be the guy. Hey, thanks for coming to the meeting, sir. You know, 0.01%. I wipe my nose and I get a cold. But anyway, um, it gives you some insight into what's happening here. Because here's what's happening. You see, you walk into your swamp, you spray your DDT, you're going to kill about 99.9 .9 or whatever the percentage is of these mosquitoes. But some of those mosquitoes already have resistance to the poison you're using. You know how we know that? Super simple. They don't die. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, no, you, you can, they can actually study the genetics and, and see these, you know, certain type of resistance that's already present. So what you do is you wipe out all the ones that don't have the resistance, the ones that do, that already have resistance to your, to your poison, they reproduce, passing on the resistance, and all of a sudden you've got a brand new crop of things that are resistant to your poison. And the evolutionist is saying, look, they evolved resistance. And the informed creationist should be going, excuse me, if the resistance was already in the parent population, how can that possibly be used as proof of the story of evolution? See, again, if you look at their own literature, look at the underlined part here, because it's talking about pesticides or DDT, house flies and stuff like that. The genetic variants required for resistance to the most diverse kinds of pesticides was apparently present in every one of the populations exposed to these man-made compounds. It's exactly what I explained. More modern article here. Every time chemicals are sprayed on a lawn to kill weeds or ants, for example, a few naturally resistant members of the targeted population survive and create a new generation of pests that are poison resistant. That's why they're constantly trying to come up with new poisons to knock these things out because they already have resistance. That's not new information. So as far as natural selection goes, if you ever hear anybody say, well, natural selection evolves things. No, it doesn't. As Professor Walter Veith uh, points out here, the very name selection implies that you're choosing between two or more variants. Natural selection never increases the number of variants. It only decreases them. So how does a mechanism that makes less and less end up making more and more? A selection process is not a creative process. Just before I came here, I hadn't had lunch, so I stopped in at Subway, and it was very busy. And I was standing there, like, you know, in the queue, and there's all these people in front of me, right? And there's all these different things you can put on your sub, right? Guess what? Everybody chose different items. And they all had different looking subs, right? But no, nowhere did I observe that any of our selecting, yeah, I'd like to have, uh, I'd like to have green peppers and, uh, and uh, a little bit of black olive. None of the selective processes cause new items to spring into the cans. Did you get it? Selection doesn't create. You're only selecting from what's already there. So what then, when you pin them down, do... Evolutionists say, oh, well, this is creating new information. Well, that would be genetic mutation. Growing up, not going to 
church or anything like that. My Sunday afternoons, I would spend it with, you know, sitting on the, the heat grater with a pile of comic books. And in comic books, you know, genetic mutations were a real cool thing because that's how you got superpowers, right? You know, a radioactive spider or some kind of radiation or something like that. And you were thinking, man, I want to get a mutation, you know. And then you grow up and find what a mutation is and you're like, oh, I don't want a mutation, you know. But um, so what is a mutation? It's a spelling mistake. It, it's, a, it's a changing of the letters of the DNA of whatever creature you're talking about that gets mutated, okay? So um, what, what evolutionists are now saying is, look, genetic mutations, which are happening all the time, okay? They can be caused by various things. They can be caused by you smoke too many cigarettes or you lived near Chernobyl or whatever, or just the actual copying mistakes that occur in our DNA because we live in a sin-cursed world and we're all corrupted, right? By the time you're 60, you'll have 40,000 mutations in every one of your cells that weren't there the day you were born. Actually, that's one of the main reasons why we're all going to die if we don't die sooner. You're going to get wrinkly and saggy and shaggy and old and die because of mutations. And that's happening to me because I look in the mirror and go, what is going on? Like, where'd that hair come from? Right? Like, honestly, I, I, I have never asked this of a scientist, but I want to ask, did I used to have hair all over the place or did it just mutate or... Anyway, so... Spelling mistakes, that's going to create new genetic information. That's what the evolutionist is now saying. So think of it this way. Let's say we take a simple book. Remember the amoeba? And evolves into a horse. So we're going to take a simple book. Goldilocks and the Three Bears. It's a very simple story. We're going to hand it to this gentleman here. You're going to make a copy of my copy. Then you're going to make a copy of his copy. Dad's going to make a copy of your copy. Mom's going to make a copy of Dad's. Right? So everybody's making a copy off of the last person's copy. Replication. Okay? Now, you guys aren't perfect. Um, you're going to make some mistakes. Maybe some of you misspell a word. Maybe some of you forget to put the word in. Maybe some of you invert the word. Maybe some of you write out a whole paragraph and, and somebody distracts you. Huh? And you turn back and you write the same paragraph out. These would all be analogous to mutations we see in DNA, right? But here's now what the evolutionist is saying. If we start off with Goldilocks and the three bears here, okay, and we make enough copies and we make enough mistakes, then eventually it turns into the works of Shakespeare. <laughs> the amoeba turns into the horse. That's a little counterintuitive, isn't it? Can you really write out enough spelling mistakes to create new functional information? That's like me taking the Encyclopedia Britannica, loading up on my computer, and just introducing an algorithm to just change his letters randomly. At first, I'm going to read it and go, oh, that's a weird word, but uh, what is it eventually going to turn into, folks? A bunch of meaningless letters. And that's actually what's happening to every living thing on the planet. It's called genetic load. I'm going to talk about it in the next session. We're not evolving. We're devolving. We're rusting away is what's happening. So, okay, that's the story, but what do we observe when we observe genetic mutations? Well, look at that. Two heads are better than one, right? But that's not new genetic information. That's just a malfunction of the DNA sequence that was supposed to occur. You can do that with pineapples, too. You can mutate all sorts of things. Here's a fellow who had six fingers, but four of them were fused together because the, you know, the completion of the DNA sequence didn't happen. Um, this creature used to have information for melanin, for color, but it's been deleted from its programming. What do you call that thing? That's a hexapus. <laughs> Harry the hexapus, he's in some museum somewhere or something. But anyway, he didn't have two of his arms bitten off by a shark or anything, he was just born that way. He's been, information for two of his arms have been deleted. Any fishermen here? There's got to be some fishermen here, right? No? You guys live on an island. Thank goodness there's one guy up there. Wow. <laughs> Where do you guys get your fish? Um, <laughs> right? Fresh fish everywhere, but none of you guys fish. Okay. Um, you're going to love this mutation, by the way, sir. Look at that. Twice as many chances to catch that guy. It's awesome. But the lower jaw isn't even hardwired into the central nervous system. It's defective. It's just a glitch. It's just a, uh, like, like a photocopy mistake that glitches and, and puts out two of the same thing. You see, in an effort to observe evolution, which has never happened, Scientists will take lab animals and they will irradiate them. They zap them with radiation to see the mutational results. And what do we see? Well, we get rats with all their hair falling out. They get cancer. Cancer is a mutation. 
We get fruit flies with crumpled wings and fruit flies with no wings and fruit flies with their legs growing out of their eyes. But we've never seen a fruit fly turn into anything like a butterfly. You just mess up the genetics of whatever creature you're talking about. It just corrupts. That's what mutations do. Okay? Now again, you will hear <laughs> arguments from the evolutionary community like this. Yes, but there are beneficial mutations. Beneficial in what way? Well, they benefit the organism. There's mutations that benefit the organism. Okay. I'm going to show you a beneficial mutation, but I'm going to show you that it doesn't benefit the story of evolution in one, any way whatsoever. For example, if you got H. pylori in your stomach, they would want, doctors would want to do something fairly quickly. It's a bug that can cause all sorts of uh, stomach ulcers and cancer and stuff like that. So how do we treat, or how do medi medical professionals treat H. pylori? Well, we use an antibiotic. And we apply the antibiotic, and we take advantage of a naturally occurring enzyme that's within healthy uh, H. pylori bacteria. And what happens is the enzyme converts the antibiotic into a poison, which is how we kill the bacteria and how it dies. But sometimes you get a mutant H. pylori. Now, we don't know it's a mutant, so we just hit it with the antibiotic. But you know what's missing? You know what's been deleted from its program? The enzyme. It used to have an enzyme, now it doesn't have an enzyme. That's not enough to kill the bacteria, but it just doesn't have it. And so it doesn't work, and the bacteria survives because of a loss of genetic information. See, that's a beneficial mutation. Well, beneficial to the bug. It's not beneficial to the human, right? So it benefits that creature, but that's no benefit to the story of evolution. Because it used to have something, now it doesn't. What does evolution need to show? It didn't have it, and now it does. The opposite of this. You see? So it's like a little bit of word trickery, so to speak. Dr. Lee Spetner, a very, very prominent geneticist, wrote a book uh, called Not By Chance in 1997. And at that time, he declared that not even one mutation has been observed that adds a little information to the genome. And do you know, since that time, there have been no reports, you just hands down, you know, reports that can say, yes, definitively we've proven that mutations can add functional genetic information. It's never been observed once. But again, oftentimes it's terminology. The teacher might be saying, well, I see evolution happening in my lab. It's a fact. But what's he talking about? The variations within the same kind. He's seeing change in living things. But Johnny's thinking that's proof that pond scum turned into people over millions of years. So, the fact is, what they're presenting in biology today has always failed to demonstrate evolution. It's never been observed once, and yet it's taught as if it was fact and science. So let's move on to point two here, and that would be showing you some scientific evidence for design in biology that confirms the Bible. You see, Romans 1.20 makes a very prominent declarative statement, and it says, for his invisible attributes, God's attributes, namely his eternal power, divine nature, have been clearly perceived ever since the creation of the world in the things that have been made so that they are without excuse. This verse clearly states that not one person will stand before God and say, hey, there was no proof of you. Because the creation proves there was a creator. That's what the verse says. And note, you can know God exists because of what has been made. So for the Christians that are running around telling people, oh yeah, God used evolution to create. Evolution is a process where everything makes itself. So supposedly, the skeptic could stand before God and say, well, even my Christian friends said everything just made itself. That's what it looks like. But that's not what the verse says. The verse says you can know God created because of what he made. That he is here because of what he made. There without excuse. So, the question I always like to ask my unbelieving friends is, if God created, what evidence would you expect to find if God had created? Isn't that a good question? Because if you don't know the answer to that question, you could be tripping over the answers all the day long. You wouldn't even know you were seeing all the evidence for God. So here's what I would expect to find if God had created, I would expect to find evidence of design, right? Do we see evidence of design in nature? Absolutely. 
Let me give you a quick example here. Um, what you're looking at is, a, is an orchid. It's a plant, right? And uh, they call it a bee orchid, and they call it a bee orchid for obvious reasons because it looks like a bee, okay? Now, not only does this plant look like a bee, it's shaped like a bee, it's colored like a bee, it's even fuzzy like a bee, this plant. If you touch it, it's fuzzy like a bee, okay? Not only does it look and colored and shaped and fuzzy like a bee, it also smells like a bee every now and then. It actually smells like a female bee in heat because it produces a ferrum that smells like a female bee in heat. It's a plant, okay? So how do these plants reproduce? It's very interesting. If you look at the schematic of a bee orchid here, um, you can see the labellum, that's the landing platform, looks and shaped and colored like a bee, fuzzy like a bee, okay? And these, um, we'll keep it PG here because we've got a mixed crowd, but these plants have both male and female parts. Enough said? Okay, moms and dads, you explain later. Anyway, the uh, female part here is the stigma, okay? And then the pollinia, that shaft there with the seed in it, that's the male part, okay? So how do these plants reproduce? Well, Mr. B is flying along one day, you know, and he's like, hey, perfume. And he looks down, and he thinks he's seeing a female bee, right? So he lands, whoop. And the way he mounts the flower, his head comes into contact with that pollinia, that shaft with the seed in it. Now, that pollinia is specially designed because when his head makes contact, it's got some glue on it and it's got a detaching mechanism and it goes and sticks to his head. And he's like, man, what's her deal, right? And he's <laughs> flying around. He's got this thing stuck on his head, right? But not only does it have the glue and the detaching device, but after it releases, it also has a mechanism that bends it down to a 90 degree angle. So he's flying around with this weird chapeau on that he never had before, but you know, guys, <laughs> one track mind is like, hey, perfume, whoop, and he lands on what he thinks is another female bee. And because of the way he mounts, that thing is perfectly shaped and it inserts itself into the female part and you get more bee orchids. <laughs> Evolve that. <laughs> Folks, how does a plant, it's got no eyes, right? It's not looking, hey, look at the way, the way bees are shaped. Right? It's, got no, it's not tactile. It's not like, hey, bees are fuzzy. I should be fuzzy. Whoop. It doesn't have a chemical lab. It's not sitting there going, oh, that smells like a skunk. Oh, perfect, a female bee in heat. As if it would have some template to work off of. You can know God exists because of what he created. That's not enough for salvation. That's enough to know you were created and someone owns you and you're responsible to them. Makes all those things you've done a little more poignant when you think of the gospel. See, Job 12, 7 to 9, ask the beasts and they will teach you, the birds of the heavens and they will teach you, or the bushes of the earth and they will teach you. Who among all these does not know that the hand of the Lord has done this? Okay, let's talk a little bit about the ethical ramifications of this debate as we transition out of this talk and we'll take our break. You know, how important is this topic, this whole creation evolution debate in society? Very interesting. Uh, Richard Dawkins has come out with some statements lately that seem to surprise a lot of Christians, but I've been picking up on uh, some of the things he's been saying for years now because, see, Richard Dawkins is one of those atheists that calls himself a cultural Christian. You know what he means by that? He wants all the good stuff out of a good Christian culture. A good Christian nation is what he, he would like. He would like people to follow the golden rule and not steal and not lie and not murder and not commit adultery. He wants all that good, good stuff. But he mocks God constantly. Um, I remember this quote from years ago. I thought it was very interesting. In 2000, he said, I'm a passionate Darwinian when it comes to science, when it comes to explaining the world, but I'm a passionate anti-Darwinian when it comes to morality and politics. Hmm. That's interesting. What does the scientific story of evolution have to do with morality or politics? Well, he's talking about social Darwinism, right? Applying the concept of Darwin, Darwinism to a society. Do we know of any uh, leaders within the last 200 years that have applied social Darwinism to their society? Stalin, Lenin, Pol Pot, Mao, 
Hitler. I don't know if you've read Mein Kampf. I've read large portions of it. He was a fanatical Darwinist. That was the whole concept of the final solution. The highly evolved German race was going to subdue and wipe out the inferior races. That's what the Holocaust was about. But see, Dawkins also turns around and says, we live in a universe which has no design, no purpose, no evil, no good, nothing but blind, pitiless indifference. Well, if that's true, who cares? Do you see what he says? No evil, no good. There's no right. There's no wrong. There's just events that happen because we're just evolved animals. We're not created in the image of God. But there's nothing special about us. We're no, no more special than overgrown bacteria. That's the way he thinks. And yet he still wants a nice Christian environment to live in. <laughs> no evil, no good, no right, no wrong. You see, if you've ever said to another person, that was wrong, you know what you're indicating? Look, there's a moral law. I know it and you know it. And you just broke that moral law. But moral laws come from moral lawgivers. And if there is no ultimate moral lawgiver, if there is no God, who gets to make the rules, folks? Sinful human beings. And it's survival of the fittest because whoever has most power gets to impose their morality upon you. Have you checked out our society lately? Imposing their morality on you? So my conclusions here are, Evolution's main arguments absolutely fail to accomplish what the theory proposes to do. There's no repeatable scientific proof for biological evolution. There's ample evidence for intelligent design. We see it everywhere. And the moral implications of evolution, which is really when you boil it down, no God, is not positive for society. So remember our key verse here, 1 Peter 3.15, but in your hearts honor Christ the Lord is holy, always being prepared to make a defense to anyone who gives you a reason for the hope that is in you, yet do it with gentleness and respect. So we need to get equipped so we can go and share the gospel with people in a way that they're going to be able to relate to. And of course, one of the things that's obviously going to come up is the story of evolution. So if you're looking for resources that uh, may help you in these areas, uh, don't forget our uh, Answers magazine. Um, um, we've got a, a special on right now. If you sign up for the Answers magazine, it's got the kids' uh, magazine inside, and we'll actually give you a free DVD pack you know, when you sign up for that. You can sign up for one, two, or three years. You can check out this um, DVD called The Code of Life, DNA. Um, basically goes over a lot of the stuff that I covered here. This DVD does so as well. Does biology make sense without Darwin? And then this one is key. How many animals were on the ark? This book, okay? Because it gets into the whole concept. Even though the dogs I was talking about, you know, the dog kind, the wolves, and all the different uh, dogs come from wolves. This gets into that in great detail, and so it, it's a great uh, book to, to check out. Again, this book, The Lie, when people ask me, what's, what's the number one book I should buy? If I only buy one book, that's the one I would recommend. Lots of resources for kids and stuff like that. So uh, check that out as well. And our Answers book series, I think it's just a, a fundamental series that all, all Christians should have. We've got a teen version, and we also have kids as well. So uh, go and check those out. Uh, I will be around if you have any questions. I'd love to say hi. So we'll, uh, we'll end there, and we'll take a break and come back for our next session, The Race of man. Thanks so much. Certainly a lot of excellent information there and, and uh, a great way to uh, digest that information is to talk about it. And